dead. And, of course, they wanted to prove that he was dead by sticking a spear into his side. And, of course, there's no doubt about it that Jesus Christ, when he come off of that cross before 6 o'clock that evening, you see the Jewish day started at 6 o'clock in the evening, went from 6 o'clock in the evening uh, through 6 o'clock the next evening. And the high Sabbath was going to be there, and, of course, it had been uh, sacrilegious for them to touch a dead body. That's why they had to quickly get Jesus off the cross, quickly get him wrapped, and quickly uh, pour perfumes and things on him, quickly get him in the grave, quickly seal the grave, because they weren't going to be able to come back for two days. Because of the high Sabbath and because of the Sabbath day itself, both of those days were back to back. That's why it wasn't until the first day of the week. And the first day of the week, of course, is Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week. And so the ladies were coming back on the first day of the week after the Passover, after the, after the Sabbath day. They would have been able to come and ceremonially been able to have gone in and gone ahead and prepared Jesus' body more for burial. But boy, were they in for a surprise when they got to the tomb that morning. Because Jesus Christ was not there. He had arisen from the dead. But that's what this week is, isn't it? This is an exciting week, really. And uh, when we're given the dates, really, Easter is right at the 14th day of April. And some reason or another, we celebrate it all different days so that we can throw, be on one Sunday. But really and truly, they, they, they uh, uh, celebrate the Passover whenever it's the 14th of April. And if it's the 14th of April and Wednesday, they celebrate the Passover on Wednesday and so forth like that. But we celebrate Easter. It comes along. I know this is kind of technical, and I don't really understand it all really myself anyway. But it's right after the spring, the first full moon. And I was looking Sunday night. It was a beautiful full moon out here. But it's right after the first full moon after the spring equinox, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox start. That's why we celebrate on the Sunday that we do. And sometimes it'd be in March, sometimes it'd be uh, different days in April. Uh, but anyway, just throwing that out there, this is very exciting because this year we're going to be celebrating it just about the way it happened on the days that it happened. And uh, that is very, very exciting on the 16th. I would think that that was the day that Jesus Christ arose from the grave. That Sunday morning, after the Sabbath day, after the, after the Passover and all these things like that. And it's just wonderful, wonderful. So if you would like to tonight, stand with me as I begin reading about something that happened 1,400 years before Christ was born. And they're still celebrating it today. Now, ain't that amazing? Jewish people do. And the Bible starts out by saying in chapter 12, verse number 1, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and, and strike it on the two side posts and the upper doorpost of the house wherein they shall eat it. <clears throat> and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with his pertinences thereof. That's his entails. Heart, liver, lungs, kidneys, and probably some unmentionable. But anyway, everything was there. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 
And the blood shall be to you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Our Heavenly Father, what an exciting passage of Scripture. Something that you instituted 1,400 years before Jesus Christ was born. Something that has been kept all the way up to 2016 by the Jewish people. But not only do the Jewish people see and respect what you have established so long ago, that we as Christians also realize that it was at this time of the year that your son went to that cross and there he died and arose from the grave on the third day. Dear Heavenly Father, tonight I pray you will continue to bless this service in a very special way for these things we ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, for the last month or so, we've been seeing how that God has been sending Aaron and Moses into Pharaoh. And God wanted to show Pharaoh that he was God. Now, the Egyptians had many gods. As a matter of fact, as I have told you, they had a God for just about everything. And God was going to prove that there was no other God. And God was going to prove to Pharaoh that all the gods that they had had and had been worshiping were worthless. Not only did he want to show Pharaoh that he was God, but he wanted to show the Egyptian people that they had been worshiping a pagan false religious system. And the people of Egypt were going to find out that the one true God had the power to do all things. But not only did God need to show Pharaoh who was God and the Egyptian people who was God, but he needed to reinforce to the Jewish people, the Israelites or the Hebrew people, that God was still God and that God was still on the throne and that God had heard their cry for deliverance and now God had arrived on the scene and God was going to see to it that about three million people were going to be set free from Egyptian bondage and God was busy showing the Egyptians through different plagues. As a matter of fact, there are 10 plagues total. Now up to this point, Chapter number 12, nine of the plagues had already been uh, brought upon the land of Egypt. And when you go back and you look at these different plagues that had already fallen on the land of Egypt, you're going to find out that one thing that the Egyptians began to notice was, and the Hebrew people began to notice was, that a lot of the plagues that was falling on the Egyptians was not harming the Israelites. Now, friends, I'm telling you, isn't it wonderful when God puts his protective hand on his people? Now, God has always looked after his people, and God will continue to look after us. That's one reason why that God's going to get the church out of harm's way before he allows judgment to fall upon this earth for rejecting his son during the tribulation period. Friends, we're going to get out of this world if we're that generation. But there's a lot of excitement in the air, no doubt about it, because if you go back, you can see that all the diseases that were cast upon the stock of Egypt, the cattle and all these different things, it didn't bother the Israelites, uh, cattle or animals at all. When you go back and think about the locusts, that how that they came and devoured the crops and the vegetation and the vegetation of the things of uh, Egypt itself, but where the Egypt, where the Israelites were staying up in uh, that area of Egypt, it didn't bother their land at all. When darkness fell, and that was the last of the plagues, the ninth plague, basically, it was the ninth plague, darkness fell so dark that they said you could feel it. I mean, it was just terribly dark. Well, Israel still had light. Now, this is an amazing thing that God was showing them. And you sat there, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, why could they not have seen the truth? Why could they not have accepted the truth itself? It amazes me how that people can choose to be ignorantly, uh, willingly ignorant about these things. Now, remember that these plagues had come to pass. And about this time now, after the ninth plague, and of course, Pharaoh kept trying to, 
who do uh, Moses and Aaron, the children of people, uh, Israel, he'd say, all right, Moses, get your God to lift this plague off of us. I'm going to let you people go and all this. Well, Moses asked God to lift this plague off, and then he'd come back and Pharaoh would say, no, no chance at all. Y'all going to get out of here. I've changed my mind. Y'all not going nowhere, and so forth and so on. But when we look into these passages of scriptures, we find out that as we look into this uh, situation, that the Bible tells us here that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, this is very important for us to realize the circumstances as to why God would harden somebody's heart. Because it was after the ninth plague that darkness had fallen. The Lord says in Exodus chapter number 10, verse number 27. And in Exodus chapter number 10 and verse number 27, look at this. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he wouldn't let them go. Now, the first six plagues or so... Uh, Pharaoh had hardened his own heart. And we see that. I see that as a pastor, as a minister, that people harden their hearts. I see people that come to church, and I see them get under conviction. And some people that are lost, and a lot of times, sometimes, honestly, you can see that they're under conviction. But yet they never come forward. They never make any pro profession of faith in Jesus Christ whatsoever. But they continue to come somewhat on a staggered basis. You know, they'll show up and then they'll go and then there'll be weeks that they're not here. And so you kind of know what it's like. But it finally comes down to the place that sometimes it seems as if though they have just willingly chosen to harden their hearts. Because you could get up and preach the messages that was one time causing them to be convicted. You could preach on the subjects that one time would cause tears to come to their eyes. But sometimes after a while, because of their own choices, they've hardened their heart. They want to live for the world. They want to go around and reach for all the gusto that they can. They want to give their heart maybe life to Jesus when they're older or something like that. But you can tell that there are times when the gospel is not penetrating their heart because they have hardened their heart. But what you don't realize is if a person continues to harden their heart, there is a, such a thing as crossing God's deadline. And in this passage of Scripture, as we've seen how that Pharaoh continued to harden his heart, he got more callous, he got colder toward God. I'm telling you that God finally said, that's it, Pharaoh. You crossed the line. You've had your chances. I asked you to let the people go. I said that I would punish you or judge you if you didn't let them go, but you were so hard-hearted and so cold and callous, you thought you knowed best, you thought you could do it on your own, and so now I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, Pharaoh, I'm hardening your heart, I've given up on you. Now friends, that is a terrible situation for anybody to be in when God gives up on somebody. But you can read throughout your Bible and you can find many instances in the Bible, not one, not two, not three, but many Different emphasis, uh, situations in the Bible where God literally gave up on some people. Matter of fact, in the book of Romans, chapter number one, he says at least three different times he gave them up. He gave them up and he gave them up. Other situations where God gave them up. Well, in this particular case, as you read verse number 27 here, the Bible clearly is saying that now God has hardened the heart of Pharaoh and Pharaoh wasn't going to let the children of Israel go. Now, by this time, I want you to realize that God wasn't pleased with he having to do this. And God, I don't think, is just real pleased when somebody keeps rejecting him as their Lord and Savior and refusing to accept his son as their Savior. But that's your choice. And, but I wonder how that makes God feel. And we can read in the book of Peter where it tells us there that, that God doesn't want anybody to perish. I mean, he's long-suffering. And he really tries to reach everybody, and he gives them an opportunity to be saved. But then when I look at Ezekiel chapter 33, and in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse number 11, listen to what that passage of Scripture there says. It's a very warm and a heart-touching uh, passage of Scripture, and it describes how God feels when lost people walk out the door, constantly turning their back on Jesus to the point that they harden their hearts, say, not today, not now, not now, and then finally it comes to the point when God does give up on them. But look at how it makes God feel. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't celebrate when somebody has to wind up in hell. 
Because he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. The world. He didn't just love me. He didn't just love you. He loved everybody. And he sent forth his son to save whosoever will. And it really grieves God when a sinner dies without Jesus. And in that passage of scripture says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that that wicked turn from his way and live, turn you, turn you from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Well, as we've seen here, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. In chapter number 10, we see how that the, uh, Pharaoh, uh, the Lord had given up on Pharaoh and it hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, if we look back at chapter 10, verse number 28 again, and verse number 29 in that passage of Scripture there, look at this again, and verse number 28 especially. Pharaoh had had enough of Moses. I was wondering when this was going to happen. Because every time Moses showed up, it was going to be bad news. You know? Every time, I mean, it's been nine times now, I would have thought, you know, after about the second or third time, Pharaoh would have started saying, I don't want to ever see you again. Don't come to me with these things. You know, I, but Pharaoh kept opening the door and allowing Moses and Aaron to come in there. And every time they come in there, there was this horrific judgment that fell upon them. But now Pharaoh, look at verse number 28 of chapter number 10. And Pharaoh said unto him, and he's talking about to Moses here, get thee from me. Take heed to thyself. See my face no more. For in the day that thou seest my face, I'm going to kill you. That's basically what he said, thou shalt die. And that's what Pharaoh said, I've had enough, Moses. Don't come back. If you come back again, you're going to die. Now we can read on in verse number 29 of chapter number 9. And Moses' response there was, and Moses says, Thou hast spoken well. I will see thy face again no more. He says, have it your way. Then we look in chapter number 11. And chapter number 11 is just basically setting the stage for chapter number 12. In chapter number 11, God is speaking to Moses and Aaron. And God is saying to Moses and Aaron, this is what's about to happen. And in this particular case, like I said, up till now, the nine plagues, the children of Israel pretty much could stand on the sideline and didn't have to get involved. But now they're going to have to get involved. They have a choice that they need to make. And the choice that they need to make is, do they believe God or not? The same choice that we made that day we got saved, do we receive Jesus or not? And now up to now, like I said, all the plagues, all the flies, the frogs, the darkness, the lice, and all the different things, God had sent them and he had spared the children of Israel pretty much. But now Israel was going to have to publicly proclaim where they stood. And I believe that Christians today are to not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if a person is saved today, they are not be ashamed to let people know that they are saved. Now, this is going to be a very testing time for the children of Israel because literally they were putting not only their life on the line, but they were putting their family's life on the line as well. Today, a person can walk in out to my hall, Baptist church, lost. They can go down or sit in a pew or wherever it is, and they can receive Jesus Christ by faith. They can get up and shout or sing or whatever they want to do. And basically, no pressure or harm will come to them. But in the days of Egypt, when this plague was being pronounced, if God was not God, and the next morning, when the children of Israel would have gotten up, most likely, they would have been stoned to death, everybody that had taken a stand for God. And I'm going to show that to you now as we look at this. But just give you a little background on chapter number 11, and you can go home and you can read that basically on your own. Because in chapter number 11, it does reveal that God is saying, I'm going to send one more plague on the people of Egypt. But at this particular time, Israel is going to have to choose whose side they are on. They're going to choose either God or Pharaoh. And at this time, God is telling Moses, go tell the people, and one of the things he's told him to go tell the people is go out and, and uh, collect 
uh, the jewelry. Go out and collect gold. Go out and collect all these things. And, uh, and, so, and, and they were going to do it. You want to know why? Because God had been getting through to some of the Egyptian people. Read that passage of Scripture. Tell them, because God had finally t uh, tendered their hearts to the point that they were beginning to wonder what's next. And so when God told the Israelites to go out and get the gold and silver and precious things of that nature, the people of Egypt gave it to them. I mean, gold, where did they get the gold for the golden calf? A slave didn't have that kind of gold laying around. They got it right here before they left Egypt. They went around, they got the jewelry and things of that nature. The people of Egypt gave it to them because God had already pondered their heart or, or they're already getting a little bit afraid of God. But also, if you read verse number 3 of chapter number 10, I think it is, or verse number 4 or chapter number 11, you'll find out that by now the people of Egypt had started showing some respect to Moses. They started showing some respect to Moses. I tell you what, after about the time you got rid of the frogs and the lice and all the diseases on your animals and the darkness and all these different things, well, duh, wake up something. This guy must have some kind of contact uh, that is worth dealing with. And so then, of course, that brings us now to this point in the passage of scriptures that I've just read to you concerning the fact here is the institution of the Passover. Now, what is the Passover? Now, the Passover is when God had instructed the children of Israel, get ready. I'm getting ready to deliver you. This is so exciting. I mean, to me, I love reading and studying this passage of Scripture. What were they to do? If you'll read chapter number 12, first 13 verses, actually read the whole chapter. It continues to do great things. But this is what God is telling Moses here to instruct the children to do. And they had to do it exactly what God was saying for them to do. First of all, on the 10th of April. He is telling the people of Israel, I'm setting apart April to be the first day of the year for the children of Israel. Of course, when the Babylonians come around, they changed it and so forth like that. April is known uh, to the Babylonians as Nisan and things of that nature. But anyway, he said April is going to be the month for the beginning of the year. Now, on the 10th day of April, you are to go out and get a lamb. It can be from a sheep or it can be from a goat. But you are to get an animal of one year old, and you're to put that animal up for four days. Now, what is the reasoning for putting that animal in storage for four days? God said that this animal cannot be sick. This animal cannot have blemishes. In other words, you're not going to get by with just delivering an animal that was going to die anyway. This is a sacrifice. This is something that would literally cost you. And you can imagine what it would have cost a slave to have gotten a lamb and to have been able to uh, uh, acquire one. But here God is saying to all the people of Israel, you get a, a lamb per household. And he says if the household is not rich enough or they can't afford a lamb, then households can come together. But when you come together, you better stick together. And he said, get a lamb, put it up for four days, and make sure and prove that that lamb is healthy and well. It's a, it's a male lamb, and it's a one-year-old. It's not old. It's not ready to kick the bucket. I mean, it's a lamb, perfect condition. That's the picture of Jesus Christ. Picture of Jesus Christ. A lamb without blemish, never sinned, healthy in all ways, prime of his life. And he said, get that lamb and keep it for four days. Now, what do you think the Egyptians might have been saying to the children of Israel during them four days? I mean, this would have had to have taken a toll because you stop and think, they could have been as many as about 400,000 households. There's about 3 million Israelites. The Bible's going to tell us here in chapter number 13 and a little bit further, there were 600,000 men in Egypt that were able to bear arms when they left out of Egypt captivity. 600,000. You put women, uh, you put children, and you put older folks with it. Uh, close to a three million uh, uh, count in population. Divide that down, look at it. You could have possibly around 400,000 households. So how many lambs is that going to take in one day's time? That's like trying to go Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve. Go out there and try to, I mean, 400,000. I mean, who ain't going to take notice of that? But anyway, they get the 400,000, 300,000, whatever you want to think, lambs, and they bring them lambs, and they put them up for four days. Now, what do you think the Egyptians are thinking? What are you going to do with that lamb? What did y'all need all them lambs for? Don't you know that that lamb is a symbol of one of our gods? 
And I hope that you're not getting ready to sacrifice one of our symbolic animals to your old God. Because Moses had already said, remember when he said, if we don't go at least three days journey out in the wilderness, because it would be a blaspheming unto the people of Egypt if we sacrifice their animals that are so associated with their gods, they'll stone us. Remember that? Chapter 8. They'll stone us. They'll kill us because we're going to sacrifice animals that are, that are, are symbols of their God. A the lamb was a symbol of their, one of their highest gods. And here they are, and them Egyptians. Can't you just imagine them saying, now what are y'all going to do with them 400,000 lambs? I hope y'all ain't thinking about sacrificing them lambs. But now listen to this. <laughs> God said, now I want you to take that lamb on the 14th day. And I want you to take that lamb's life. And I want you to cook that lamb. And he gave the whole instructions. Head, feet, hooves, entails, everything. Cook. But this is how you got to cook it. You better not boil it. That's what it means, sod. Don't put, you, don't put no water in this. You've got to roast that lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but you ever been around barbecue places when they're out there cooking? I'm going to ask one or two little pieces of meat. Can you imagine... What the area smelt like were about 400,000 lambs on the pit. In other words, this ain't going to be no secret. And don't you know that the Egyptians were not dummies, that they were probably figuring out what was just happened to about 400,000 lambs that represented one of their highest gods, and they smell this aroma coming up from the slaves' quarter or the slave section or from the area where most of the slaves had been located at, and they smelled roasted. Well, Lord, we we'll boil it. You know, nobody know it. You know, we can keep it secret, God. What would be the difference? It's dead. You know, what would be the difference? Anyway, God was teaching them that in order for them to be saved, a life had to be given. And in order for us to be saved, a life without blemish had to be given. And the life that was given for us was not given in secret. And the people of Egypt could not keep it secret. If they did, they were not following God's instructions. But now this is, this is, the, this, this is the kicker. What were they to do with that blood when they had taken that, life, uh, that lamb's life? They were to catch the blood from that lamb... Now, what were they to do with that blood? Inside or out? So they have to make a decision now, right? Now, remember what no doubt was going to happen to them if God didn't deliver them. They were to take hyssop, dip it in that blood, and they were to paint the sides of the door on the outside of the house that they were living in and across the top. Now, there again, don't you think that the Egyptians couldn't figure out where that blood come from? They're smelling the roasting lamb. They're seeing the blood out here. They were taking a public stance, declaring their belief in God. And they were putting their life on the line. And here we find in this passage of Scripture, <laughs> if you'll go back and you'll read, and I think it's in chapter number 11 where God says, and you go back and read, where God says, by the time I'm done with them, Moses, they're going to throw you out of Egypt. He says cast, but it means throw. Pharaoh's going to throw you out of Egypt. Because when they, they painted the, the thresholds, a public symbol of their belief in God, that goes completely against the Egyptian worship system totally. And in that, and in that as, they, as, they, as they did that, that night at midnight, that night at midnight, they killed the lamb on the 14th, I guess, and then that night at midnight, here come an angel that traveled all over Egypt. And this is an angel of death. And everywhere that angel went, in verse number 13 of chapter number 12 says, And when I seen the blood, I will pass over you. 
So everywhere those Israelites painted the threshold, painted the doorpost around their door, entering into their house, the angel of death would just fly on by. But it didn't matter who they were, Pharaoh's son, poor Egyptians, middle-class Egyptians. It didn't matter who they were. If they didn't have blood on the doorpost, the firstborn of every house died that night. And the firstborn of the beast died that night. A catastrophic event transpired. But just the, cho just the older, it could have been an older person that was firstborn. Didn't have to be just necessarily the baby. Could have been an older person that would have been the firstborn. Thank God, I was way down the list. But then Pharaoh got so distraught because he lost his own son that he literally throwed him out of Egypt. Now, this is amazing. What were they to be wearing? Read, read that in them verses there again. Chapter uh, number 12, read back and say, they were to be what? Clothed when they began eating? And, they described, and he described how to be. He said, I want your loins girded up. In other words, you know, they wore like this kind of a robe type thing for no better description. But when they girded up their robe, they would pull it up to, Maybe about their knee height, and they'd tuck it into a rope or a belt or something around their waist so that their legs could be more freer to, to maneuver. When they went into battle, they'd gird up their, their robes. Or when they was out working in a field, instead of it dragging the ground, they'd, they'd gird up the robes. But he said, gird up your robes. When you eat the lamb, make sure you got your shoes on. Make sure when you eat the lamb that you got your staff nearby. And so what God was telling the children of Israel, you got to show that you got faith in me by publicly proclaiming it with the blood on the door, but you also got to be ready to go. Now, I believe with all my heart that this day and time which we're living in, people better be getting ready. Because I really believe we're living in the latter days. And I believe at any moment, we're going to get out of this world. Just like the children of Israel, when they got the word, they were ready to move. They weren't going to be leaning around. They weren't going to be hanging around. They were going to be on the move. And we need to be ready. Because when we get the call, we're going to be on the move. The Passover. A lot in there for us to look at. A lot of us to realize how it was the Lamb of God that shed his blood for us to be saved. An innocent life had to be given so that we could live. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. You ready to go? Are you ready to go tonight? Have you already made your, uh, made, uh, made your reservations through Jesus Christ? Amen. Let's stand to our feet tonight. What an exciting day. What an exciting time that we're living in right now, right here at the time of the Passover. Wow. It's wonderful. Our Heavenly Father, we do bow before you, and we are thankful for Jesus. We're thankful, dear Heavenly Father, for his willingness and his love to go to that cross, and we're thankful for him willing to die for me and to die for whosoever wanted to be saved or would be saved. And Lord, I pray that tonight, if there's anybody here that's not ready, I pray that tonight they would get ready through Jesus. I pray that tonight, dear God, they would accept Jesus as, their, as their, their Lord and as their Savior and as your Son. Lord, touch every heart now for these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Page 210. My Jesus, I love
Well, God bless you. I hope you all have a good remaining part of the week celebrating Jesus. And let's gather together, especially this Sunday morning, and let's celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. But let's be dismissed now in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, allow us to go with you, Almighty God. And Lord, I pray that, Heavenly Father, you will help us and encourage us and strengthen us and give us boldness that we'll be able, dear God, to lift up Jesus before every person that we come in contact with. For these things we ask 